My name is Deb Bailey, and I'm the Folk Arts Specialist with the Missouri Folk Arts Program, and I'd like to introduce uh, one of our past, both past apprentice and past master artists in the Traditional Arts Apprenticeship Program. This is Mike, Michael Massey from Montgomery City, and he was an apprentice in 2011 with master saddle maker Martin Bergen, and a uh, master artist in leather carving with your apprentice, Mike Noonan. We learn from, from every saddle maker that we ever get together with. There's always something to be learning. You know, it's, uh, Martin's got a, a thing that uh, if you ever get reached the point where you think that you have nothing left to learn, you need to stop because that's when you will never grow. You, you'll, you'll stop growing and things will And uh, uh, I like that. Well, Martin is a great guy and he's, he, he's, he's, a, he's a wealth of knowledge. Uh, and I was, I was really honored when he asked, you know, would I be interested in doing that? And it kind of came at a time when Martin was having a, uh, some health issues. Uh, <clears throat> but we got together and, and uh, uh, did it, and this saddle's here today that, that was there, and, and uh, there's so many things that you learn. I'm you know, trying to pick out one, one point. Uh, Martin did have a, he's got a, a technique that he uses to measure uh, uh, where the the ears on the saddle seat are placed when you when you cut out a saddle seat. That's the bane of a lot of saddle makers. That's where it's the it's the largest part of a saddle, the largest piece of leather, and it's the most, it's the easiest to mess up. And so where those ears are placed, where they come back to when you stretch that seat in, and everything closes up to where those what we call the call them the ears, where they come back up in right along the base of the camel on both sides and tuck mm -hmm. in behind right there. Oh uh, yes, that's a very difficult area. It's a very difficult area and to get that measurement absolutely right is very difficult to do. Uh, and Martin came up with a little piece he made out of two pieces of leather. A, a, a strap and a nail and a, an adjustable piece on it that he can place that dead center of the seat and come over and make a small mark on the on the saddle seat piece once you've began to to form it to get it going in towards the same and that that measurement be exactly the same from the dead center of the, of the seat in mm -hmm. the pocket of the camel. Uh, Martin says it works every time. And I, uh, I made one of those and so far it has worked every time. It, what I, I learned from Martin was the slicking of uh, the uh, swell cover now that I don't know what that means. The swell cover is is uh, probably the next largest piece uh, that covers the swell, uh, which is they call it the pommel. That looks like a difficult area. And that's too. a lot of stretching goes into that. That in the seat has the most stretch, uh, and it has to be formed, wet formed, stretched in, done again, worked down. So. Uh, Martin said, and, and I agree 100% with it now, uh, that he would always slick that leather before he would ever put it on the foreman, which opens the pores and allows like, uh, pre-stretch. It's almost a so pre-stretch. So it's, it's, it's another wetting process? Or? Well, you, you have the, 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 the leather. Anytime you want to form veg, veg tan leather, uh, it has to be wet. You have to have a you have to have a hydration level in there that allows it to mold. Right. Okay, and when it dries out, it holds the shape. Uh, but 
doing that, pre-slicking that, gives it a pre-stretch, oh. and it also allows, because leather shrinks when it dries. Oh, it does? It, yeah, okay. It, it shrinks some degree, but you want a lot of that, because of, of that pre-stretch done, because it, saddles are prone to being in all kinds of weather and that leather gets wet you don't want it you don't want it getting loose or baggy again you want that to stay nice and tight okay on there wet or dry so taking some of that stretch out before you put it on and mold it and stretch it you're just that far ahead of the game later on down the road or if, if this you know, horse lays down in a in a river and wants to roll, or yeah. is this out in the rain? That's that's the reason for for doing that, and I I like that. I like mm -hmm. that concept. Uh, you now the apprenticeship program is all about teaching, of course. Sure. And um, I was wondering um, if you felt you learned something about teaching in that process, and Ooh. and how? Yeah, I I I, I did. But I think when you do something a lot, and I do it every day, I think there's things that you don't think about every day as being tough. But when you get somebody who doesn't really know the processes, then there's a whole lot to teach. But there's all the teaching in the world is only as good as the hands-on of the apprentice doing the work and being able to do it for themselves then everything comes together, mm -hmm. you know. Was there particular things that you felt were the most important to communicate to him during that teaching process? Uh, yes, uh, leather selection, tool selection, and how those tools work and how to apply them, uh, the, the depth of tooling in given areas because everything changes when you get into floral carving and. Uh, that sort of thing so that you you get the most realistic look to it and the use of a swivel knife and the control part of it and there again you know I would stress to him every day you go home and practice and practice practice making those swivel knife cuts till you get it becomes so automatic the muscle memory becomes right to where when you pick that up, you're going to be able to do these things. And, and it's the positioning of the swivel knife and the carving uh, that it remained perpendicular, you know, to the piece of leather, 90 degrees. It okay. cannot be... It can't be like... You can't, if you... And the natural tendency is to turn it to the side and see what you're cutting there. Well, that's going to be an undercut. That is not going to tool well. It's it's going to flatten out. You know, it's got to be because you have to bevel that out, and then you have to form this piece that you that's going to be a part of the element of your of your work. Mm -hmm. And uh, that took uh, a lot of drilling and redoing with Mike. You know, which it does with a lot of people. You know, but I think in general, I think he came out of it pretty well. You've had both now the experience of being an apprentice and a master. And we were just, one, uh, I was just wondering like what your personal thoughts are on the process of experiencing both ends and what you might have gained from that. Uh, well, I think any time you get to work with someone that's, that's, that's been doing it for so long as a profession, uh, you learn a great deal. Things that maybe you, I, I couldn't bring to mind, but it's just, uh, there's so many things that you learn. Making great coffee is, is one of them. <laughs> is it uh, strong? Oh my gosh. Yeah, it's strong. <laughs> I figured. Yep. You betcha. Yeah, yeah. If you don't learn, you like, can yeah. like, yeah, flow the horseshoe in it. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, That's, and from yes. a teaching standpoint, I think it's good whenever you see somebody remain enthusiastic about it and want to learn more, you know. I mean, that's rewarding to me uh, that, uh, and, and that you, you know, your wish for it is that, that they carry it on uh, 
-hmm. And they improve as they go through it, and then they teach someone to keep this, this thing going.